So thank you for being with me again. Uh, this is the Bible study for Thursday, May the 28th. It's kind of hard to believe we're heading towards the end of May. Um, and when we started this study to provide something during time of quarantine, I had no idea it would be going this long. I'm guessing you didn't either. But one of the things I've heard from folks is that there's actually an appreciation for this. It gives, uh, gives people the opportunity to engage in a Bible study on their own whenever they have the time. And that's something we'll probably continue as we move forward. It may take a, a week off here or there over the summer to give uh, Courtney a break, give me a break, uh, give you a break, but just know this is probably going to be something that we continue to do as part of our ministry offerings at Denver United Methodist Church. So Matthew 9, we, um, we're we talking about Matthew and the uproar that calling Matthew to be one of his disciples would have created within the larger Jewish community, but also within his band of disciples. Uh, as we get ready to talk about that, let us ask God to help us. Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to pay attention to what you said in your word. And so lift up our hearts, our minds, and transform us to be your people through this time that we spend with you intentionally. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, and so uh, Colin Matthew... Mm, pretty making him part of the community uh, of his community of disciples was one thing but then it goes on to say that Jesus actually engages Matthew's community he just doesn't pull Matthew out of the tax collector world he actually engages with the larger tax collector community uh, 9 10 and as he sat at dinner in the house Many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. I mean, this is, oh, it's like having ISIS over for dinner. It's like having the, um, the, the gang uh, come over. I'm talking not the gang in a good way. I'm talking about, you know, how we often think about these cartels and drug gangs. It's like having them over to your house and sitting down with them. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Uh, with the, and, and so they, they're sitting and eating with his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, they are in, impugning Jesus' behavior. But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not sacrifice. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Jesus is saying, this is why I came, to engage those who are lost, those who are broken, those who are far away from God. And, that, and, and to the Pharisees and to the scribes, you know, he's saying, you've given these people no pathway to come to God. And as a matter of fact, you work extra hard to keep them away from God. I'm creating a way for them to come to God, and this is why I came. Um, I love this image. I, I came not for the well, but for the sick. I came not for the righteous, but for the sinners. Um, those who are sick don't need a physician. I've come to be the physician for those who are desperately ill. Um, this reminds me of Something that happened to me when I was uh, pretty young in my ministry. I was in, serving my first church on my own. I was 28 years old, maybe at this time, maybe 29. Uh, been in ministry out of school only two or three years. And I had volunteered to serve as a uh, on-call chaplain at Northeast Medical Center, which meant that uh, I would take a weekend uh, a week on call at night uh, and the weekend. So basically it meant if they needed a chaplain, um, they would call me and I would come in. And there were probably, I don't know, eight, ten of us who did this. So it wasn't that often that I did it. Once every couple of months, you know, that's just no more than six times a year. Uh, and I'd had some training in this in Divinity School. So I, I knew a little bit about what I was doing, uh, but the challenges of serving in a, a hospital setting as a chaplain are many and varied. And I remember um, 
getting a, um, a call to come down to the emergency department, and I did, and I, I come in, and um, what had happened was this young woman who was only 32, 33 years old, um, not much older than me, had, um, fortunately, she, she dealt with depression, and her answer to that um, was to put a plastic bag over her head, and she suffocated herself to death. And so I get there, I get the story, and the nurse says, and her parents are right out there. So I go and sit down with the parents. Could you imagine being the parents of this young woman dealing with this? And the, the mom, she, uh, she looked at me and she said, you know, after we talked just for a minute, and I told her that I was basically the chaplain on call, that I served North Kannapolis United Methodist Church, and you know, I was I was there for them. She she looked at me and she said, uh, or she asked, "Is my daughter in hell? What do you do with that? Right? What do you do with that question?" Uh, and again, I was not a very experienced pastor. Um, I was, and I said one of those really quick prayers of, "Oh God, oh Lord." You've got to help me know what to say in this moment. Because uh, there's this interesting thing that there is a, a tradition that is part of church history that says if you commit suicide, you go directly to hell. Where does that come from? Uh, well, it, it actually doesn't come from the Bible. Now, let me, let me pause right now and say that uh, suicide is a horrific thing. It is never the answer. Um, to take your own life is not what God desires for anybody. It is heartbreaking to families and it is heartbreaking to God when this happens. So where does this understanding that often is, is part of our, um, I would say, popular religious understanding that if you commit suicide, you go directly to hell? It comes from uh, the teachings of Thomas Aquinas, who was known as the doctor of the church. Um, Thomas Aquinas wrote uh, a lot of uh, what becomes known as dogma, which for the Catholic Church, um, and again, this is before the Reformation, uh, way before the Reformation, for the Catholic Church, dogma is uh, considered the same as Scripture, as authoritative. And so Aquinas wrote about that if you committed suicide, you go to hell. Uh, and where does he get that from? Well, Aquinas was not only influenced by the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, uh, Aquinas was also heavily influenced by Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, you remember Plato and Aristotle who lived some 300 years or so before Jesus? That's where it comes from. It comes from Aristotle. Aristotle says, and this may be completely boring you to death, but just hang with me. Aristotle writes in his philosophy, his understanding of how the world works, that the greatest good you can do is to fulfill your potential. So the greatest good, the highest good any human being can ever do is to fulfill the potential that they innately have. Uh, to live up to their potential. The opposite of that is also true, that if you fail to live into your potential, then you have failed, you are uh, leaning towards evil. So if you, if you completely thwart your potential, then that is evil. If you live into your potential, that is good. Uh, and so part of Aristotle's reading of Aquinas filtered through his Christian understanding led him to uh, create this dogma, this teaching that if you commit suicide, therefore you're cutting off your potential, and therefore you have it is evil, and therefore that is a mortal sin that sends you to hell. Um, and that whether we know where that idea comes from or not. Uh, Many times we have that idea in our head. It's interesting how we develop ideas about uh, faith and God, and we don't ever stop to examine where those ideas come from. I remember hearing a professor talk about that most of us, uh, our understanding of good and evil 
uh, comes more from Paradise Lost, which is written by John Milton, than it does actually from the scripture. So uh, the influences upon us are many and varied, and sometimes it's very helpful to dig into what you believe and why you believe it and what's actually taught in the Bible. Again, suicide is not something that is ever part of, should ever be a part of the Christian existence because that's not what God desires. But it doesn't mean that when someone commits suicide that they're beyond the love and grace of God. And so I prayed that prayer real quick, Lord, you've got to help me. And this scripture, um, uh, the way Matthew tells it, uh, the way it's recorded in the other gospels, it just, it was, it was, felt like, like God gifted me with that. And I, I was able to look at her with the grace of God, by the grace of God, and say, you know, Jesus says, I didn't come for the well, I came for the sick. That those who are well don't need a physician, those who are sick do. And that for your daughter to do this meant that she was not well. Uh, you don't kill yourself if you're well. And my hope and my prayer is that she is in the presence of the one who can provide her with that healing right now. Uh, now notice I didn't, I didn't say what her eternal state would be. I just expressed my hope. Uh, and my hope is that she found the love of God somehow, some way in the midst of her hurt and her brokenness and her misery. Because that's, that's what Jesus does. He, he comes to us where we're broken. He redeems us. He heals us. And he makes a way for us to come to him. And through him, to be in relationship with God. Uh, because that's who he is. Now, yeah, you don't have to agree with my point of view on this. Uh, but that's just where God led me in that. And... Um, Jesus came for those who are sick, not for those who are well. Um, so and then he goes on to talk about and to contrast himself with the, um, the Pharisees in this way. In 9.14, Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? Again, these are the disciples of John the Baptist who were very ascetic uh, in their and the way they follow their rules. And Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. Uh, what he's saying is, look, um, I'm only going to be with my followers, my disciples, for a short period of time. That's not the time for them to fast. There will come a time when they need to fast. And then he says something that may be one of the hardest things for any of us as human beings to ever deal with, and that is things are changing. Things are different now. Um, and that he's doing something brand, brand new and it's gonna be hard for them to understand it. I know change is just so hard for us. Uh, we get so used to our ways and what we do and our comfort level. It's part of how we survive this world. We need routine. We need things that we can count on so that we're not in a constant state of agitation. And this whole COVID-19 stuff, I think that's part of the angst we feel is things have changed and we're not adapted to that change very well. And so we're pushing so hard for things to go back just like they were. Um, we have a hard time with change. But yet again, Jesus is doing something brand new. He's doing something that's going to reshape the world. Uh, and he's doing it in their midst. And so he's asking them to think about that uh, and to know that look, the rules that you are used to, they're not going to apply any longer. You're going to have to learn a completely different way of doing things, which is part of what the Sermon on the Mount was about new way of understanding, a new way of doing, a new way of being. Um, 
And that, that newness is going to cause anxiety. It's going to cause disruption. It's going to cause upheaval. But yet, that's also what Jesus does. He changes us. And when he changes us, we can't help but change that which is around us, um, which often meets with resistance. Um, so that's where we're going to end today. We'll take up next week with Matthew 9, verse 18. And uh, just know that we should be back on a regular schedule for next week where we will have a Bible study posted for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So thank you again, and God bless you, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you.